Let's get back into the book of Isaiah this evening as we are studying. And I made mention last Wednesday that um, we were no longer going to be talking about Cyrus. A shift was getting made there in chapter number 48 to where now we're going to be speaking ahead to a future deliverer. Who is that future deliverer? Well, Isaiah was speaking 210 years in advance to a future deliverer by the name of Cyrus, a Persian king who had let Israel go out of their clutches to go back to their homeland, out of exile. But now we very smoothly shift from Cyrus, 210 years in advance, a short-term you know, fulfillment of that prophecy, to a long-term fulfillment of the prophecy in Jesus Christ. Now he begins to speak of the servant of God, as was mentioned in previous chapters once more. He begins to speak of Jesus Christ himself. And so as we look at the next couple chapters, we need to make sure that we are looking at it through the lens of God telling Israel, prophesying to Israel about Jesus Christ, who he is, what he's coming to do. So as we get here into chapter number 49, um, some folks would have a difficulty understanding exactly who these chapters are talking about. Some might say that, well, judging by the, the fact that it is speaking in first person, and we know Isaiah wrote this, then Isaiah must be speaking of himself when he speaks here, that he's speaking of himself, but is he really? As we go through chapter 49 and 50, you're going to see claims made about this person who is being spoken of that Isaiah could not fulfill, that Cyrus could not fulfill. The only person who could fulfill these prophecies in the next, the next couple chapters is Jesus Christ. And so we get here at the very beginning here, uh, the Messiah declares his mission. Look at verse number one of chapter 49. We'll read the first two verses. It says this, Listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken, ye people, from far. The Lord hath called me from the womb. From the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name, and he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand hath he hid me, and made me like a polished shaft. In his quiver hath he hid me. We go back to that first phrase, Listen, O isles, unto me. We've talked about this in previous chapters in Isaiah. When you get back to chapter number 40 and previous ones where he talks about the isles, what's he talking about? He's talking about the far countries, the coastlands, not literally islands, uh, but he's talking about the faraway coastlands, the countries far off with, uh, you know, heathen nations speaking different languages. He's talking to them, the far flung regions, the far flung nations. He's talking to them. Listen, O islands unto me, hearken ye people from far, he speaks to. He says, Gentiles, listen to my voice. He says next there, the Lord hath called me from the womb. Now, later, we, as we read on, we, we, it gets revealed to us who is being spoken of. Now, I've already let the cat out of the bag and told you who this chapter is about. But as you read along, it does become revealed to you who was being spoken of. Being revealed is Jesus Christ who was called from the womb. If you go back to Micah 5.2, um, Jesus was called even before he was in Mary's womb. Yet here he starts with a point, you know, which we can readily, readily relate to. You know, he's called me from the womb. He said, from the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. In Luke one thirty one, the Lord through Gabriel declares the name of Jesus there when Mary was just newly pregnant with this baby. She doesn't even know she's pregnant yet, but the angel Gabriel comes and says to her that she is going to bear a child and it is going to be God's son and that his name is going to be Emmanuel and gives her the name of the child. He says also, he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. Now, when we speak this particular phrase, you know, your, your, your tongue is like a cutting knife or he has a cutting tongue or a sharp tongue. You know, when we use that phrase nowadays, uh, it has a different meaning than what it would have taken on here. Uh, today, of course, a sharp tongue means 
Uh, you're using unkind and coarse words and you're, you're hurting people with your words. But when this verse here says, he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword, what it means is that the Messiah here is given power and authority. While some others might need to brandish a weapon to have power and authority, or some others might need to, you know, strengthen and, and, and you know, thicken their muscles uh, in order to bear strength and authority. Uh, you know, you must obey me because I have more weapons or guns or nuclear weapons than you do. So we are the bosses around here. He does not need weapons in order to be the boss. All he has to do is speak. And so he says, he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. The words of Jesus Christ are far more powerful than the weapons of the Roman soldiers or the temple guards or even any modern-day weapons or armies. He's made my mouth like a sharp sword. He goes on to say, In the shadow of his hand hath he hid me, and made me like a polished shaft. In his quiver hath he hid me. So Jesus is prophetically proclaiming here that he has been carefully made. He has been carefully formed like a, a polished arrow in the service of the Lord, ready to be used at any time. Oh, that we all would view ourselves and prepare ourselves in a similar way because God does have a use for you. Whether you're five or seven years old sitting in the pew or, you know, much significantly older than that or anywhere in between, God has a use for you. Are you a polished shaft like an arrow that has been made perfectly straight? with an arrowhead that has been finely and sharply cut, put into the quiver, prepared and ready to be launched off at the need of the master. Are you prepared and ready, or are, do we allow ourselves to come apart? Do we allow ourselves to grow dull? Do we not make ourselves ready and useful? That when he has need of us, and he puts his hand back to the quiver to go and pull one of us out to use us, we're not there. We're off chasing some other dream or some other shiny thing. We're off serving ourselves. We're off living in darkness. We're off backslidden and dull, but not ready. But here's a prophecy that he will be ready. Maybe this is a reference to those 30 years of Jesus' life where um, he was I mean, hidden. He wasn't really hidden, but you know, we don't know a whole lot about the early years of Jesus. I wonder about those early years. I mean, he obviously had to do something. We are told that as he grew up, he grew in favor with God and man, that, um, you know, men, man liked him. You know, the people around him liked him. He was a good kid, you know, as he grew up. And he, was, he was, grew in favor with God as well, that he was honest and he was upright. And he was, frankly, he was perfect. That must have irked his brothers and sisters, you know, <laughs> to have that perfect brother that never did anything wrong. It's like that one that goes up to you and says, I know what you did. You stole that. Now, either you go and tell mom you did it or I will. Ooh, I hate that. <laughs> I don't like to be threatened like that. You go tell on yourself or I'm going to go on telling you. But either way, you're going to get found out. This is your chance. I wonder how many times Jesus had to use that line on his brothers and sisters or his friends at school and stuff. I can only imagine what it would have been like to have grown up with him. But during those early years where he was there, he was in body, he was growing up, he was learning, he was uh, strengthening himself, probably learning a whole lot about carpentry, probably learning a whole lot about using woods and building and being skillful with his hands. But even during that time, was, was Jesus just going out and defiling himself? Was he going out and using all of the curse words and drinking and partying with all the other 18-year-olds that were running around? They're going out and getting involved in revolutions or going out and partying or, or, or going out and sleeping around with whoever they wanted. Was this the life that Jesus was living? Well, no, because otherwise he wouldn't be growing in favor with God, would he? No, that's not who Jesus was. He was lying in wait, ready, prepared for when God would use him. Are you lying in wait, prepared and ready for when God will use you? We continue on to verse number three. And said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for naught and in vain. Yet surely my judgment is with the Lord and my work with my God. Now, 
verses 3 and 4 can be a little bit confusing because I've already prefaced this chapter with this, this verse is talking about Jesus Christ, but then in verse number 3, and he said unto me, thou art my servant, O Israel, and he names them as Israel. Well, then who is he speaking of here? I mean, the whole context of the chapter indicates that it's speaking of the Messiah. So I think it's best here to, to understand that this name Israel is being given to Jesus at this particular moment, given to the Messiah, because after all, Israel means governed by God. And Jesus submitted himself here to God's will, not just in his death on the cross, but submitted himself to God's will throughout his entire life. So while on the outside, we might read this, you know, you are my servant, Israel, might make us think of the nation of Israel, but there would be a contradiction there. Because if you, who's he speaking to? Well, if it's Israel, then look at verse 5. There'll be some confusion there. He says, and now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be a servant to bring Jacob again to him. Though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord to bring Jacob again to him. Is it the job of Israel to bring Israel back to God? That's my question. Maybe I lost you somewhere in the maze along the way. Is it Israel's job to bring Israel back to God? Well, no, that's the Messiah's job. It was his job to come to this earth to bring, to return Jacob back to God again, to restore him. And so if in verse number three, Israel is literally the nation of Israel, then it would contradict verse number five. Uh, so in other words, in verse number three, I believe here, when he's speaking to Israel, he is speaking of the Messiah. We continue on. It says, then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for naught and in vain. Yet surely my judgment is with the Lord. He says, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for naught. What does he mean by that? I have labored in vain. Why would the Messiah be saying words like that? I've wasted my time. I've labored in vain. Well, again, if we go back to verse number five, he says, And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be a servant to bring Jacob again to him. It was the job of, of Jesus, in a sense, one of the reasons he came was to call Israel back to God. Now, I'll get ahead of myself, but one of the other reasons he came was to call Gentiles to God too. But he was to call Israel back to God. But what happened when Jesus came to Israel? By and large, they rejected him. So then, did he accomplish this purpose, uh, as is mentioned here? Not exactly. Maybe that's why he is saying, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for naught and in vain. Because Jesus came, it's prophesied that he would come, and his goal would not be accomplished, at least not then. Now, we know that there will be a time when, when Israel does turn their hearts back to God. And that is after the church has been raptured and removed away during end times. And that's why he goes on to say, after, after you know, in vain, he says, yet surely my judgment is with the Lord. You know, it might seem that the coming of the Messiah would, what, is it going to accomplish little to nothing with Israel. That he's going to come and they're going to sweep him off to the side and reject him. It might seem like it was completely in vain that Jesus came altogether. But we'll just go ahead and trust the Lord and trust his judgment. When we consider what and who the Lord Jesus had to work with on this earth, we must believe that one of the great temptations that he might have faced was discouragement. We think of Jesus as perfect, that's because he was. But that's not because, it's not because he never faced any temptation. It's not because he walked along and everything was just smooth and swimmingly in his life all the time. It's not like he never faced discouragement or depression. It's not like he ever faced physical temptation over this or that or everything under the sun. The fact is he did suffer temptations because he had a human body. He had flesh like yours, and so he had temptations like yours. But he withstood those temptations. Is it possible that Jesus was discouraged? I would think so. Again, you have degraded yourself from being the creator God 
to being a man, limiting yourself to the form of a man, limiting yourself to the time and place of a single man. Remember, God, he exists outside time. He exists outside of matter. And so he could be anywhere in any time he wants to be at any time he wants to be. But when Jesus confined himself, when the son confined himself to the body of Jesus, now he is in one place, in one time. He's confining himself in many ways to the strength of a single man, the capacity of a single man. We don't read about Jesus performing miracles during the first 30 years of his life. And it would seem that even as a young boy, when he went to the temple and he was asking questions of uh, the religious leaders and doctors there in the temple and, the, and then the synagogues where his family came and found him, he was asking them tough questions. Does that mean that he was all knowing at that particular point? You know, there's a big question, you know, uh, did he limit himself when he was young and when he was growing up? Did he limit himself in his knowledge? I mean, did Jesus just come out of Mary able, you know, to do algebra uh, and able to talk? Or did he have to learn how to talk? And did he have to learn how to walk? I believe he had to learn all of those things. It's kind of hard for us to really uh, grasp this concept, but I do believe that he limited himself in many ways and had to learn how to do, learn all sorts. So there he was in the synagogue because he had a very clearly defined purpose of being the Messiah one day. So he was in there asking him question after question after question. And what were they amazed at? They were amazed at probably his tenacity in question and his, his thoughtfulness in questioning them. But then, after all that, he takes on his ministry now. He, he, in a sense, he, he puts on uh, the cloak of his ministry, and here he goes out to minister, uh, to accomplish his task. And time after time after time, he is rejected. Now, certainly there are many victories along the way for him. But by and large, the institutions rejected him. The religious leaders rejected him. The schools of theology rejected him. The churches rejected him. The Jews as a whole rejected him. Wouldn't, wouldn't that have made you discouraged? If you had gone through everything that he had gone through to get to this point to win them over, only to meet with very, very, very limited success, humanly speaking. Now, Looking back, we understand that he knew he was not going to win Israel over. That was prophesied long ago. He knew that they were going to reject him. Isaiah prophesies that in another you know, 13 chapters. He'll tell us more about that. It's prophesied that they're not going to want him, but there is going to be a day where these things are fulfilled. And he knew that as well. And so I get that out of this passage. Then... I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for naught and in vain. Yet surely my judgment is with the Lord. It might seem like what I'm doing is, is pointless right now. You know, kicking against this, this dead tree that's Israel, trying to get them to change, trying to get some life into them. It might seem pointless, but I'm looking farther, farther down the road and I'm trusting the Lord. Now we get to verse number five. He says, and now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant. He formed him from the womb to be a servant. Why? To bring Jacob again to him. He says this, though Israel be not gathered. So in other words, you didn't, you know, you didn't go and gather them yet. You didn't you know, reconcile them back to God yet. Though Israel be gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eye of the Lord. And my God shall be my strength. You know, though Israel did not all come, you know, fawning all over Jesus, and they didn't all you know, just immediately, you know, place their faith and trust in Jesus who has stood there before them, he said, yet in the eyes of God, I'll be glorious, and my God shall be my strength. And he said, it is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to him, I'm sorry, yeah, to him whom man despiseth, to him whom the nation abhorreth, to a servant of rulers. Kings shall see and arise. Princes also shall worship because of the Lord that is faithful and the Holy One of Israel. 
and he shall choose thee. We go back to, it is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for the light, for a light to the Gentiles. You know, though it was part of the Messiah's mission to, to bring Israel back to God, he also had another mission, and that was to reach out to the Gentiles. What is he going to do for the Gentiles? It said it there, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. And when he speaks to the end of the earth, he's not talking about to the moment the earth is destroyed and comes to an end. He's talking about to the farthest reaches of the earth. So here he is, to him, the Messiah, uh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong one, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. So that Jesus was to be the salvation, not just for Jerusalem or for Judea or for Israel, but for Africa. That Jesus is to be the Messiah and the Savior for Africa and for Scotland and for Russia and for Alaska and the United States. And all of the indigenous peoples that were there, you know, if, if there were some there back in this particular time period. It's an interesting study to find out who lived here in North America prior to the American Indians, because there was somebody here before them. Uh, it's an interesting study. I've been um, hearing you know, more and more about uh, as some Christian uh, archaeologists, uh, and um, I don't know what the correct term for somebody who studies DNA is, uh, as they're studying to find out who, who lived here prior to the American Indians as they moved in. Uh, it's an interesting study, but uh, he died. He is the savior for those people. Those people we don't even have a name for. The ones who were building mounds in Mississippi prior to that, you know, he was the savior for them. So he says, to restore the preserved of Israel, I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles. Israel has light. They were given this light. Israel had an advantage over the rest of the world because they, from their very conception, had God, Jehovah God. And they had his word that was given through his prophets, through Moses for a time, through Joshua for a time, but through the prophets. The Gentiles did not have that. So Israel, Israel needed restoration, but the Gentiles needed both light and salvation. So he says, Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to him whom man despiseth, to him whom the nation abhorreth. The Lord here is speaking to Jesus and reveals that he is going to be the one that man despises. So we have another passage here. You can add this to Isaiah 53. If you ever have a chance to speak uh, to a Jewish person who doesn't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, here's another passage indicating that the Messiah is going to be someone that the world despises. In fact, there he's going to be somebody whom his own nation abhorreth. His own people hated him. Tell Israel that. You know, I think modern day Jews, I've, I've been told this, that mo many modern day Jews don't believe the Messiah is actually going to be a man. They believe he has not come yet, but they don't believe he's actually going to be a man, but a system uh, that is going to come one day. It's an interesting concept. The Old Testament speaks specifically of a man. And the world is going to despise him and his own nation is going to abhor him. We continue on. Kings shall see and arise. Princes also shall worship. You know, in the end, the Messiah will not ultimately end up being despised and abhorred, though. He is going to receive the worship and honor he deserves. Why? Because he is the chosen of the Lord. You now we've been studying church history, and throughout church history, you, there's there's times and places where, um, you know, a particular state has a a church. You know, and of course that goes very very wrong every single time it happens. But you sometimes have kings and you have princes who are bowing down to him. But of course, if we look to long term fulfillment of this, there is going to be a time where Jesus Christ stands as the sole ruler of this entire earth in Jerusalem. And during that thousand years when he rules and reigns, all kings and princes are going to be coming and they're going to be bowing down before him. And if not on this earth during that millennial reign, then certainly they will bow down before him 
in heaven one day before they either are allowed into heaven or they are sent to an eternity into the lake of fire. Every knee shall bow, the Bible says. We go on to verse number eight. Thus saith the Lord, in an acceptable time I have I heard thee, and in a day of salvation have I helped thee, and I will preserve thee and give thee for a covenant of the people to establish the earth, to cause to inherit the desolate heritages, that thou mayest say to the prisoners, Go forth to them that are in darkness, show yourselves. They shall feed in the ways, and their pastures shall be in all high places. They shall not hunger nor thirst, neither shall the heat nor sun smite them. For he that hath mercy on them shall lead them, even by the springs of water shall he guide them. And I will make all my mountains away, and my highways shall be exalted. Behold, these shall come from far, and lo, these from the north and from the west, and these from the land of Sinem. As we look at these, this particular chapter, I want to make sure I point something out here. He is speaking, yes, of his Messiah. And he is speaking of the Messiah's goal of bringing Israel back to him and of the fact that he has made a covenant with Israel and he's not giving up on them. Hey, let's remember that. God did not give up on Israel, has not given up on Israel. And as we look at the Messiah's job, some would say that God replaced Israel with the church. Even John Calvin and some of the other reformers would have said that. They would have said that uh, the church has replaced Israel. And so anywhere in the New Testament you are reading about Israel, what he really means there is the church. However, understand this, Jesus' job was to restore Israel back to God, and so he will one day. So then if the church replaced Israel, then that makes no sense. Also understand this, that this prophecy was given prior to Jesus living and dying, prior to Jesus ever coming. Jesus was the beginning of the church. And so Israel still, after Jesus, was going to one day turn their hearts back to God. We can understand that from this passage as we continue to go on. But I want to go back uh, to the passage that we just read here. He says, In an acceptable time have I heard thee, and in a day of salvation have I helped thee, and I will preserve thee. So the Lord um, extended his help and preservation to the Messiah throughout his earthly ministry. We can think of a time where they were getting ready to grab Jesus and kill him. And, but then Jesus was able to just slip right out of that crowd miraculously without anybody knowing. There was a, a, a certain level of preservation there because it wasn't Jesus' time to die. His promise had to be fulfilled, which means he had to get to the cross in order to do it. It's a beautiful thing to imagine Jesus comforting and strengthening his soul with these passages. I mean, Jesus would have known these passages very well, even if you and I don't. Can you imagine him sitting there in the garden of um, Gethsemane, looking forward, not maybe with great anxiety, but looking forward to his death on the next day or so, imagining the great pain that he was going to have to suffer and the shame he was going to have to suffer bearing all those sins, but yet comforting himself with these verses that we read. In an acceptable time have I heard thee, and in a day of salvation I, have I helped thee, and I will preserve thee, he says. I wonder if he found comfort in those based on this promise that the Lord would hear him, would help him, and would preserve him. He says, and give thee for a covenant of the people. So Jesus, the Messiah, he wasn't just bringing a covenant. He was the covenant to the people. He is, I should say, present tense, a covenant to the people of Israel. A covenant here is a contract. Uh, binding. And Jesus is that bond, binding the promise of God to the people of Israel that they will one day be returned back to him. And so here is a covenant, a promise that is the man Jesus Christ. So no, the Israel has not been done away with. The church has not replaced them. Jesus is the bond. He is the glue with that promise. He says, 
that thou mayest say to the prisoners, go forth. We think about Jesus' ministry as he set people free from bondage and imprisonment. He set the demon-possessed man free from the bondage of chains and from demonic torture in Mark 5. He set the sick and diseased free from the bondage of their infirmities time and time again. And according to John 8 and Galatians 3, Jesus sets those in bondage to sin free. Jesus sets those who are in bondage to the law free from having to keep the law or attempting to keep the law free from having to only do sin. And it is Jesus Christ who brings this freedom. It wasn't religion. It wasn't sacrifice. It was Jesus who brought this. We go on, it says, For he that hath mercy on them shall lead them. Even by the springs of water shall he guide them. So in an immediate sense, you have uh, the promise of Cyrus who is going to release them one day. And then they will be able to make their way from, ba uh, from, from Babylon um, and from the areas where they were held captive in these groups all the way back to Jerusalem. And God was going to make a way for them. And he was going to protect them. And he was going to provide for them as the exiles returned back to Israel. But there's also, again, a long-term fulfillment of this passage where he says, you know, he shall lead them. Even by the springs of water shall he guide them. In a larger sense here, it speaks of the mercy and provision of God for people as they return to him in the last days, as they come from far. He said, I will make all my mountains a way. This term way means a pathway, a road. I will take my mountains, my mountains that I build, my mountains that I'm responsible for, I'll level them to make a pathway for my people to come home. So let's stop and think for a second. You know who some of the most hard-hearted people to try to witness to are right now? Some of the most difficult people to witness to are Jewish folks. Because they have a religion that they cling to so tightly. And even if it's not much of a religion to them, but merely just an ethnicity to them, still, they cling to that so tightly as if it alone is good enough to replace any need they have for Jesus or Christianity altogether. Sure, Christianity, y'all can have your time. You know, you guys do pretty good over here. But you know what? I, I have something better than that they have in their own minds. No, I'm a Jew. I'm Jewish. As if that somehow excuses them. They can be some of the most difficult people to witness to. But let's not think that it's impossible. Let's not think that, well, there's a mountain and it's impassable and I could certainly never get through that. It's all over now. It's impossible. God says, no, no, no. I can bring down my mountains and make a road if I need to. And I will. As he speaks to the reconciliation of Israel here. Each, every, each and every mountain, all mountains, there's no exception here. There's no obstacle, there's no loneliness, no trial, no sorrow, which can get into the way of God's richest blessings. There's no situation of entanglement. There's nothing that you can possibly think of that God cannot remove from your pathway. We go on, he says, and these from the land of Sinem, he's talking about here, um, you know, I can bring them from the north, I can bring them from the south. And then he talks about from the land of Sinem, which is uh, kind of a question mark. What is the land of Sinem? Um, a lot of people suggest that it's Egypt, um, probably the area of Aswan in the southern border of Egypt. Some think that it is China, um, that area out east. And you know, it would almost make sense that here he is speaking. Um, I will make all my mountains and the highway shall be exalted. Behold, these shall come from afar, lo, from the north and from the west, and these from the land of Sinem. It would make sense if Sinem was either east or south. But um, it doesn't matter because what's the point of the passage? It's not that we know exactly the lands that he speaks of. It's the idea that I'm going to bring them from anywhere and everywhere, from the farthest reaches, even the places that we don't even know their names because they're not on the map. Maybe it was a place that nobody knew anything about. We don't know what Sinem is. That's, my, that's his point. I can bring them. There is no mountain tall enough that I can't make a road through. There is no river wide enough that I cannot make a pathway through. There is no land far enough away that I cannot bring Israel back once more. 
So the Lord's faithfulness here. Look at verse number 13. It says, Sing, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth, and break forth into singing, O mountains. For the Lord hath comforted his people, and will have mercy upon his afflicted. But Zion said, The Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. Listen to this. Listen to the, the dichotomy here. You have um, God speaking in one hand, sing heavens, be joyful earth, break forth into singing mountains. The Lord is comforting his people. The Lord will have mercy upon his afflicted. But what do his people, what do the afflicted say? Oh, the Lord hath forsaken me. The Lord hath forgotten me. What a difference between God's view toward his people and his people's view toward him. It simply assumed that the people the Lord has comforted are going to return His praise back to Him. Just like it's assumed that we as Christians are just going to praise Him. That we're going to sing with joy in our hearts and smiles on our faces. And that we're going to stand up and, and, and deliver our praise-filled testimonies back to the Lord. It's, it's just assumed that it's supposed to happen, but does it happen? Many times, no. We as Christians do not offer our praise back to God. We've got too many other worries or woes or dissatisfactions on our heart that we couldn't be bothered to lift up our praise to the Lord one way or another. What about Israel? God promised Israel peace and comfort. God promised Israel reconciliation. And what does Israel sit there and think? Hum, humph. God's forgotten us. He's rejected us. He's left us. That's why we're in the situation that we're in. But the rest of chapter number 49 and chapter 50 is going to answer this question. Has God forgotten you? Has God rejected you? Because of their captivities, Zion, which is that the tallest mountain in the city of Jerusalem, is going to wonder this. Does God really care about us? And God is going to answer this question that many have asked even since. Think about this promise that is given here. Think about this covenant that is being given here by a man who had not yet been born and would not be born for a long time. The promise is that Jesus would reconcile God's people, Israel, back to him. In addition to that, he is going to provide a salvation for the Gentiles as well. You see two different things there. You have the people, God's people, Israel, and you have the Gentiles. So no, the church does not replace Israel. Look at verse 15. Can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? And if, if, I, if it hasn't been clear enough yet in this passage that God has not rejected Israel and that God has not cast them aside forever, listen to this promise. Can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. Thy children shall make haste. The destroyers and they that have made thee waste shall go forth of thee. Lift up thine eyes round about and behold, all these gather themselves together and come to thee. As I live, saith the Lord, thou shalt surely clothe thee with them all as with an ornament, and bind them on thee as a bride doeth. We go back. A question he asks, which is kind of a well-duh kind of question. He says, can a woman forget her uh, sucking child if she's nursing a child? Is she just going to forget about her nursing baby and, and walk away and never return back to him? Now, has it happened in the past? I'm sure it has. But those would be the very rare exceptions to the rule that a woman would not care for her sucking for her nursing baby and would just forget him and let him die. But even though it's rare for humans to behave that way, a human mother to behave that way toward her child, it is impossible for a God to behave that way towards his children. He says, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. He makes a promise to Israel. I will not forget you. You're my children, and I will not re reject you. I will not forget you. He says, Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hand. What's he talking about there? Think about this. 
Maybe this is speaking to when Jesus hangs upon that cross and he gets those nails through his hands, those nails that Thomas comes up doubtingly and wants to touch. And those hands, even to this very day, still has those scars in it. And one day when you get to go and you get to stand face to face with Jesus, what what a moment that's going to be. I mean, I know we're not supposed to be scared about going to heaven, but I tell you what, that that makes me nervous, I think, to stand before Jesus and, and God, whatever his presence looks like, to stand before him physically for the first time, to be able to see and experience his presence, and then to see literally those scars of where the nails were put through his hands those permanent scars. He says, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. There's a beautiful fulfillment here in the nail-scarred hands of Jesus. When Thomas doubted, he said to Thomas, Behold my hands. You don't think it's me? Look at my hands. You will see proof, irrefutable proof in my hands that I am who I say I am. When we see the nail-scarred hands, we'll see how he has inscribed or engraved us in the palm of his hands. With that kind of love, how could we think that God would have just forgotten us? You know, sometimes we'll joke with the kids, like, all right, we're leaving, here we go. And they'll come, ah, screaming, running, no, don't forget me, don't forget me. I was like, okay, calm down. Have we ever forgotten you or left you at home or anything like that? No, no, no. Okay, then why are we going to start suddenly doing that now? We wouldn't do that. We wouldn't actually leave you behind, even though we might joke about it. You know, we wouldn't actually leave you behind. Why? Well, because we love you. Now, that's saying that. I know know, uh, sometimes children do get left behind places unknowingly, (laughs) like the mall or Walmart or Lowe's or something. Their parents leave and forget that they left a kid in there. I remember one time in youth group, we had a, a school bus, and we probably had, uh, you know, 30 or 40 teenagers. And um, we, were, we were doing a, I don't remember exactly what you call it, but we were going from fast food restaurant to fast food restaurant. And part of the activity was they had to eat different parts of their meal. They only could spend so much money. And so they could only spend so much at each of these restaurants and eat different parts of their meal as we moved along. And we left a kid at one of the restaurants because uh, he went to the bathroom and we didn't know it. And we left. And it was two or three restaurants later. We're like, where's Steven? <laughs> Does anybody know where Steven is? And uh, somebody called him and we found him and it was all good. But we found Steven. He was a good kid. I like Steven. But we wouldn't forget our children on purpose anyways. And how much more will God not forget us? Because he's graven us upon his hands. He says, thy walls are continually before me. I believe these walls here refer to the city of Jerusalem. Remember, Jerusalem's walls were all broken down. At the, or they were going to be broken down when they were taken over by Babylon. But then after Persia releases them and they're able to come back and they begin to rebuild those city walls. What is he saying here, though? Is he just speaking specifically of walls? I believe he's speaking figuratively here to the, the health, the strength, the prosperity, the security of God's people. Because if you had strong walls around your city, it was strength for you. It was health for you. It was prosperity for you. Because you could afford to spend time and labor upon those walls, which meant you had foods growing in the fields to feed your soldiers and to feed your workers, which means you had men with armor and weapons upon those walls. So you were doing well if you were able to fortify your city. And he says, your walls are ever before me. Your your health, your strength, prosperity, your security, it's always there. I'm always mindful of the condition of my people, despite their own doubting about me. And so he speaks here to Israel. And I will not, I will not ever forget you. I will not ever, I, I lost my notes. I'm trying to find them again here. If this thing will cooperate with me, I think. I've sent them away. Let me get them back here real quick. <clears throat> I was trying to play that one off like it didn't happen, but <laughs> I couldn't get my notes back fast enough to uh, smoothly go straight back into it. All right, here we go. Back into verse number 15. You know, can a woman forget her sucking child that she not have compassion on her son or room? Yea, they may forget. 
yet will I forget thee. But when I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands, thy walls are continually before me. He goes on to say now, thy children shall make haste. Thy, thy destroyers, thy children shall make haste. Speaking to you know the, 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 your children 200 years from now are going to leave Babylon and they're going to make their way back here. They're going to make haste back to, me, back to Jerusalem. On top of that, your destroyers, those that made you know, laid your city waste, they're going to leave you. God's going to take care of them. He says, lift up your eyes round about and behold, all these gather themselves together and come to thee. As I live, saith the Lord, thou shalt surely clothe thee with them all as with an ornament and bind them on thee as a bride doth. And here he talks about partial fulfillment, you know, Babylon coming and destroying them, but then also one day them being able to come back and use the strength and the money of Babylon in order to rebuild their city. Their children are going to come back here one day as if they are bearing this ornament of Babylon upon them, returning to Jerusalem and rebuilding. Now, I'm not going to get to verses 19 and following this evening, but we'll look at those. And we'll talk about God's continued blessing upon his future blessing upon his people. Understanding, yes, he is speaking to the return of Israel from Babylon when Cyrus of Persia allows them to come back. But we're also speaking to the future fulfillment of these passages as well. And also along the way, understanding this, that God has made this promise to Israel and it, that Jesus himself is that binding glue. He is that covenant to them. The Jesus who had not yet come, but the Jesus who has come and began the church, but the church is not Israel. We are the Gentiles that he came to bring salvation to but he is also going to turn Israel back once again to him. And so chapters 49 and 50 are focusing in on the Messiah. He's coming and what he's going to do. And of course, it doesn't just stop in chapter 50. Ultimately, you know, we're leading up to chapter 53 in this chapter about a man of sorrows. And I've been looking forward to getting into this section for a long time, and it's still several weeks away, but uh, we'll get to it. And I'm looking forward to that. If you have any questions about the book of Isaiah, uh, you can ask, and I'll try my best to answer. I know it can be sometimes tedious uh, to go through some of these sections. It's nice to get into new things. Like we're in chapter 49 and 50. We're kind of turning the corner into talking about the Messiah. And as we go through these, what would help you, as it helps me, to do when we're going into these verses is to think, how does this apply to us as the church? Yeah, well, let's think long-term fulfillment. How do I see this being fulfilled one day during end times? How do I see this being fulfilled today with the Gentiles and the church? And it helps us to be able to take those things and apply it to ourselves. And these promises, which, yes, the promises were made to the people of Israel, but God has also made promises to us, you and I. And if Jesus is the covenant, he is the glue, the promise that... Um, that, that, that binds Israel to God, what else is he the glue to? What else does he bind? I'm not going to answer that question for you. you got to go think about that. I'm looking forward to continuing uh, to study here in Isaiah.